And so if you can consider I was born on the other side of the world at night instead of the morning, I wonder who I'd be and how I'd be. And that could start to break up your own identity. Welcome to the Ron Real Podcast. Are you dreaming of changing your life through opening a business? Or are you curious what obstacles entrepreneurs had to overcome on their journey? Then you're in the right place. My name is Agnes Billig and I'm your host. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Raw and Real. Today's guest is Abigail Gazda. She's a clarity coach and the CEO of Hearts Unleashed, a transformation company committed to empowering people to operate with full freedom, power, and self-expression in every area of life. Abigail is also a best-selling author, speaker, and podcast host. Hey, Abigail, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Me too. Uh, So I'm excited to get to know a little bit more about you as a person. Can you share with us a little bit how your upbringing shaped your perspective on life? Yeah, yes, um, definitely. Thanks for asking. And uh, my perspective is an interesting one, I would say. I grew up a student athlete. uh, So, so much of my identity was wrapped up in athlete with my upbringing. I've been dribbling a basketball since the first grade. So, it has a lot to do with who I think I, who I think I am. And then, um, I think that being an athlete and growing up, I share a lot of this in my first book, giving up, giving up the memoir of a quitter. I talk about, you know, that competitive mindset and the way that I was always competing, whether that be like on the basketball court or in the classroom or just to feel good enough. I was, I was very often competing for something. And um, oftentimes that was for validation or approval uh, or an achievement, right? Like a goal or a victory or something of the sort. And so that became just a very normal way of being. I grew up in the middle of the country in the U.S. in Chicago, Indiana. And so it's very um, like a lot of people would probably relate to Chicago, right? Being fast paced and like grind, like go get them and, and all of that, the very masculine energy. And I definitely picked up on that growing up um, to be able to keep up, uh, be a powerful woman. I was the teacher. I had been a manager. And so, so much of my upbringing was a very competitive one where I learned that winning is good and winning equals like likable or worth it or, you know, proved my worth in that process. And so that's, that's a lot of my upbringing. And I've made a lot of shifts to that. Uh, as I've grown into my adult years, but it definitely shaped who I was and, and who I am today. So the winning part, um, where did you really notice, um, that it didn't have a positive impact on your well-being, basically? Great question, because I didn't know that, right? Like, there were years where I was not doing well, maybe physically or emotionally, but I did not understand that yet. And so that shifted after divorce for me. So I got divorced at age 27. And so, um, or actually like a few days before I turned 27. And so, uh, that was a big shift for me because I, I thought that if, all I have to do is like dream it and do it, which I know that to be true for us as humans. Like if we can see it, it can be, it, it can be created, but I was living up to other people's expectation of success, right? Like I believed very much in the process of like, you date, you get married, you buy a house, you have children, you get your career somewhere in there, right? Like I believed in this certain structure for success and what success meant like what people's definition society's definition of success was and while there's nothing wrong with that order or pattern uh it wasn't very authentic for me and i didn't know that because growing up in the midwest like you kind of end up having this typical dream for success and for your life which is to get married have kids and and be financially well off and all those things and And that's wonderful, but that wasn't like, I have much more of a free spirit and adventurous spirit, like a nomadic type of energy where I I love to explore. I love to expand. And, uh, when I think about it in retrospect, that's not what I would have created for myself. Right. I did get married, but we didn't have children. We didn't get a house. Like we didn't go that far in our marriage to where, 
I like put myself in a situation where that was my life and there was not many alternatives, right? So the life that I live now, I am very nomadic. I speak for traveling. I can work from wherever, whenever. Like I love that freedom that I've created. And so not knowing the way that like competitive was like harming me or the winning, like you asked, not knowing how that was, um, I was kind of like winning myself into a box. (laughs) Uh, I was winning myself into a corner with boundaries and edges that would have ended up being a cage or trapping me as opposed to like having me be my definition of successful. So I didn't know myself enough to know what I was going for. So what really happened, because like you mentioned before that you had this picture in your head of what success looked like. So being married, having kids, having a good job. So what happened that led actually to a divorce and how did that transform you? So I, like I said, I thought that I knew what I wanted. So I was just going straight forward. And, and in a way my husband was too, we were, um, you know, he was very agreeable. So we went along with it. We didn't argue. We weren't a couple that like, we didn't have that. It wasn't, crazy or tumultuous, nothing like that. It was just, this is what's next. This is what's next. This is what's next, like for the both of us. And so we kind of just like, it just went that way. And then um, with that being said, about six months, we were together for six years. We went to college together. That's where we met. We dated out of college and everything like that. And what seemed like the next right thing was to move in. What seemed like the next right thing was to get married, right? So it just kept moving right along. And then about six months after marriage is when my husband said, I made a mistake. This isn't what I want. I don't want to be married. And I thought I'd get used to it, but I, I haven't. And I don't want this. And, and for me, I thought we were still moving right along. And he was stuck somewhere in I made a mistake. And so we were now going like in different directions at this point. And, you know, one thing that that hurt while it happened was he wasn't sharing his feelings with me. So like he was dealing with what he was dealing with on his own. And I was still like kind of fantasizing about this life we would be living into. So that was really disruptive for me because it was very unexpected in my mind. And so that transformed me because I did not, did not understand. And it led me to question everything, including like myself, right? Like my my smarts, my judgment, and my capability, my worth. And so that really transformed me to start obviously questioning everything, which caused me to question why I was thinking I wanted what I was going for. And when I really took a a good hard look at that, it was because it's just what I thought was normal and expected. But now what, what really clicked for me was I had this second chance at life and at love, like I can do this again. And I'm ultimately, whether it feels good at right now or not, I have a blank slate. And so with that, I used it to my advantage. I used it for the opportunity that it is to take another look at life and, and see what I want. And then I just started doing a lot of self-discovery work, like really looking at who I am, what my values are, what I'm committed to. And, and that's where things really started to shift. And what were some of the beliefs that you adapted in the time before your marriage and also during the time that you noticed that also kept you stuck in that state and that didn't allow you to be your true authentic self? I would say the the biggest belief was that like winning gets approval and I, I equated like approval and validation as love. I was always just looking like looking for that like good girl like you're good job right and like you know, not being, um, not being someone who causes waves or causes a problem either. Like, you know, I, I, and it wasn't that it was ever directed at me. I think that I picked up in my observations, whether it be in movies or from my parents or in school or coaches and, and teachers and everything is bad. Like being, um, misbehaved or a troublemaker is bad. Right. So I didn't disrupt anything. I made sure to live inside of the expectations of what like a good girl is, a well-behaved girl, or again, the student athlete, like get good grades, win the games, 
go home and have fun, right? Like play with your friends. And so I wasn't, um, I, I maybe call it very bland. <laughs> I was very bland, <laughs> but, um, nonetheless, I had, cause I grew up having an amazing life. So I won't take away from, you know, I didn't, it wasn't super traumatic and I, I'm grateful for that, but I think that every, we all develop in certain ways. Like I remember, um, for me, my mom worked a lot. My mom worked a lot, a lot, like 60, 70 hours a week. And I remember wanting specifically her attention. So I knew that being good and doing good things got her approval. So that's where my belief systems kind of got set up was just make sure you be good and mom will be happy. You don't have to be something for her to worry about. And so that shaped a lot of like following rules, being a perfectionist and all all of that kind of ways of being. So that's where those belief systems really solidified. And as a clarity coach, you also help people to find out what it is that they really want, right? So what is it that makes it so hard for us to find out? (laughs) a lot good question and for everybody it's a little bit different right but um so much of the way we were brought up we have been told who to be how to be when to be there what to wear what to say right like I believe that education has done this on a on a very big scale that um it's kind of like not in the conspiracy theorist way but like school is mass producing children into people into like um well behaved human beings who follow order and 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 abide by rules and so um it's very much shaped so many of us and not only just what the following rules and you know sitting in rows and quietly and not being disruptive right like we've learned that very subtly and also pretty directly but ultimately we haven't been our creativity hasn't been nurtured. And so we have been in a way like kind of whitewashed in in that sense of like, this is what's right. This is what's good. This is what's expected of you. For the most part, we fall into that. Even our troublemakers or even the outspoken ones still have been put into a certain amount of order where even going a little outside the line is too much. So we get back in line. And With that being said, because our creativity hasn't really been harnessed, we've also, one other feature that's happened is that we have been told and now believe that our authority lies outside of us. This is a big factor for so many people because when we're going through something, we are looking outside of us for the solution, whether that be in a higher power, in a mentor or an authority figure or like just the world in itself, or we're looking in, um, you know, consumerism, we're looking for a quick fix. We believe that our answers lie outside of us. And that's because, you know, that it lies in a textbook or it lies in the classroom or the teacher knows the answer. And, and we're still just like always learning. We become addicted to learning in the way that we don't think we know anything. And we do. And that's, you know, if, for people to get a chance to hear that, they can start becoming more curious about what they know that they know. So how can you really recognize, you know, what you've been programmed to, let's Mm -hmm. say from school Mm -hmm. and, and what's really you? Yeah. Great question because, well, I'll say that it doesn't happen the same way for everybody, but I consider it your awakening moment right? Like there's usually a, a shift that happens in our lives. For me, it was divorce. For some people, it's a near death experience or job loss or financial hardship, right? Or substance abuse. It's usually pretty traumatic the way that we come to our awakening moment. And that's not true for everybody. There's a great, um, a book, uh, Michael Singer, the surrender experiment. He talks about how his awakening moment was not traumatic. He was sitting on his couch with a friend having a conversation and he just like realized his entire life at that moment. And so some of us, it's traumatic. Some of us, it's not, but really looking at who am I, like questioning who am I, what's important to me, right? And it usually um, requires a detachment, 
we are so attached to our identity, right? Like I said, athlete, teacher, daughter, student, like those were my identities. And I was fine with those. I was those, they were me. And that's very human related. And so when I step outside of identity, so a great way to just shift this immediately for people is consider the you that you are right now was born in a different country to different parents at a different, in a different year. Who would you be then? What would your preferences be? Would you still like the same foods? Would you have the same accent? Would you care about the same thing? Would you have the same traditions? No. And so you, you can immediately look at most of your desires and preferences have been based on the environment that you've grown up in. And so if you can consider I was born on the other side of the world at night instead of the morning, I wonder who I'd be and how I'd be. And that could start to break up your own identity where you start to look at what might be different if I said so. Love that exercise. So uh, what do you think uh, is the best way to reprogram your subconscious mind in your opinion? Oh, (laughs) how much time do we have? (laughs) Great question. Uh, So something that may exist in our subconscious is I don't belong. I don't fit in. I'm not like them. And so we will naturally follow our own rule of I don't belong. So we will um, avoid certain situations. We will decline relationships or sabotage them. We will, you know, we don't want people to get too close to us because we don't want to feel, we don't want to prove true. I don't belong. And then sometimes when we do take a chance and get close to someone or something, it falls apart and we're like, see, I knew it. I don't belong. I'm a, I'm a bird and I'm an outcast. I, I just need to go move to the mountains and hide away. Right? So our subconscious is a very funny thing, but the thing that I'd like to teach everybody is that our subconscious manifests things in our life to communicate with us. So if we manifest a situation where we feel triggered, I don't belong. It's because the subconscious is saying, you believe this. And it's not like we have to know intellectually that that's not true. We, we belong in this world. We're here for a reason. And so if we were to, if we were willing to go take our chance and disprove that truth, that fact about us, we would be able to go realize that that's completely made up and we can go succeed anywhere, any way, the way we are, the way we'd like to be. And so reframing or re, um, reprogramming the subconscious, I like to suggest the tool that a lot of therapists, I, you, I, I, as a coach, I don't, I'm, I don't claim to be a therapist, but I say exposure therapy, go prove yourself wrong, right? I'm unlovable. I, I'll never forget the time I told my sister, I'm like, I didn't know that I believe I'm unlovable. And she's like, that is such garbage. Like you're one of the most lovable people I know. Like, why would you even think that? And I'm like, I, I, that's how I feel. It's how I feel sometimes. And she was like, yeah, that's not true. And so when the day she told me that I started to go up, put myself out there in different ways. And I'm like, yeah, that's fake. (laughs) That is a lie that I tell myself. And the subconscious has those lies stored. The lies we tell ourselves to keep playing small, right? To not confront our fears. We are very afraid of our own fears. And so we stay safe, we stay comfortable. So how could we reprogram this? Get out there, go face your fears, right? If you think you're unlovable, go start dating. If you think you're incapable, go start a new project, right? Like prove to yourself and you might stumble and fall. You might. The whole point is that you don't give up. If, if like you asked a couple questions beforehand is like, how do we find out what's important to us or like what we like? is once we discover what we like and we're sure about it, when I realized and accepted that I'm an entrepreneur, I want to work for myself, right? I had to keep showing up for that. You better believe that I didn't think people wanted to pay me. I didn't think that people would hire me, um, you know, month to month to month or come back to my business. There's a lot of things I didn't believe in myself. And I just kept showing up and facing those fears. 
and I proved every one of them wrong. And so that it's really about showing up for what we believe and what we want. I really like that. So um, another thing that I still wanted to dive into with you in a previous chat, you mentioned that you're currently working on your book that is focused around the topic to transform judgment. So uh, what do you do when you feel that judgment comes up for other people? So this is so important because as I just answered in the last question is like, we judge ourselves more than anyone else judges us, right? We are our toughest critic. And so it's very likely that other people judging us is a reflection of our own judgment. So we have to become very self-aware about what our beliefs are. And let's say someone, I say, I'm going to start my business. And my mom goes, wait a minute, starting a business is, you know, it's hard. That's not smart. My mom and God love her. I love my mother. I know that I'm saying like, she worked a lot and this and that, but I, she's a great example. So um, when I started business, she's like, well, why don't you just stay a teacher or, you know, a corporate job is much safer, right? So uh, my mom values safety, security, predictability, familiarity, and that's great. That is great for her but I am not a nine to fiver. It's not, it's not in my nature to show up to the same place every day and do generally the same thing. Like that's just not for me. And, and for some people that's great. But so I wanted to start a business and my mom's judgment was that's not, that's not reliable. How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to take care of yourself? What if, what if, what if, what if? So my fears, cause you better believe, like I said, I was afraid of failing. I was afraid of not getting paid. I was afraid of not being successful, all those things. And they showed up in my mom. It's like my mom was a mirror for me to see my own fears manifest. So she was the voice, but I had those fears too, and I wasn't giving them a voice. So when other people, this is for the, for the listeners, is like when someone else is judging you, you just take a look. Don't be offended. Be curious. Why did that judgment show up for me in my life today? Why did someone reflect, hey, have you gained some weight? Right? Like we might be fearing we gained weight too and insecure about it or not feeling really good, but someone just happened to say it or reflect it. And so we can take that and look for ourselves. Where am I ignoring my own fears or insecurities? And what can I do about that? What is there for me to do about that? That might be an action. That might be a resolution, right? Like healing a part of us. But we, if I know that I've gained weight and I know that I've been eating a little bit more at this time of the year, or I've been you know, not working out anymore. Uh, I might know that. And I might know that I'm also not working out and I'm also eating junk food. And I know that I've been doing things that don't serve me. Right. When it comes back to the business aspect, I know I should be calling people. I know I should be putting myself out there and I'm not. So it's an integrity issue as well. When judgment shows up, it's probably because we're ignoring something within us. Again, it's the activity of the subconscious mind. Changing that, is that in your opinion, just basically taking action of what you're afraid of? I like that. Yes. I would say fast answer is yes. And then um, it might look like healing some wounds. That might look like therapy. That might look like hypnotherapy, coaching. But ultimately, the reason we aren't taking action is because of the fears that block us. So we like you're when you're six and you raise your hand in class and you give the wrong answer and everybody's like, ha, ah, that was dumb. You're you were dumb. Like we realize, like, don't speak up before you know the answer, right? And we will drag that through life where we don't speak up unless we know the answer. So we turn into perfectionists, we turn into overachievers. Or we turn into slugs, right? Like we're like, well, I'm just going to quit and not, I'm just not going to do that anymore, right? Like I don't want to be embarrassed. So it's likely that we have some, some unhealed wounds in our past too, 
that prevent us from taking those actions. So it either looks like exposure therapy, go do it, try it, find out, or slow down, back up and heal some stuff from your past. And what do you think does it really take to thrive in life? Healing your past, <laughs> putting your past in your past. We are great. We are so great. We are brilliant. We are capable. We are divine. Like we're already all of those things. It's done. There's no developing that, right? What there is to do is shed who we are not so that we can become all of who we were made to be, what we came here to be. Now, something that I noticed when I was shedding and shedding and letting go and letting healing my past, that was great. And I was developing and I was really inspired. Like I could see the whole vision of my books. I could see the vision of my business and all of that. Now I'm really good at what I do as a healer and as a coach. What I wasn't good at was being a businesswoman. That is something I had to develop right? So just because we know what we want, there may be some skills we need to acquire or some support we need to get to build the bridge from where we are to where our vision is. And so I would say, yeah, definitely two things is heal your past and all of that so that you can become who you are. And then when you know who you are, get the appropriate assistance to building that part of your life. And if you look back on your journey, what was overall like the hardest moment for yourself that you really thought, oh my God, I'm not going to make it or, you know, everything is just like going completely wrong and I really don't know how to fix that. I would actually go all the way back to my college age where I tore my ACL in my knee. So I was a college basketball player. Again, my entire identity rested on athletes. And when I tore my knee, it was the night before my sophomore season started it was at a practice that like was not important. <laughs> Nobody saw it except for the team, right? Like it wasn't this big show. And I tore my ACL, which is a season ending injury and also requires surgery. And so I was devastated. It was the most depressed year of my life because I didn't know, I definitely didn't know who I was if I couldn't run up and down a basketball court and score points. And like, it just wrecked me. And I spent, I spent a lot of time, like I started abusing substances. I started like self-medicating. It wasn't, it wasn't a positive experience and it certainly wasn't an empowered experience. Right? I just was not empowered around it. And so what ended up having to happen was, you know, healing, but it took like three to four years of this cycle of feeling sorry for myself. And I kept trying to come back and play basketball, but because I refused to just acknowledge the injury, I further injured myself. I sped through recovery. I was working too hard on an unhealed knee and I just fought, caused further injury. And because I was injuring my knee, I was also injuring my, my ego, my identity. So I was hurting internally, but I had no idea how to, how to deal with that. And that was, that was pretty traumatic, I would say. So what do you think was, was uh, the learning out of that experience for yourself? It was so much around like identity crisis, right? Like you're not your title and you're not your role. You are you and you are valuable. And so you're going to have to like not put all your eggs in one basket, right? Like not put your whole identity in one role and realize like you're special the way you are and you don't need to perform to be likable or lovable or a contribution, right? I only knew that if I was con to contribute meant to being at practice on time, being the captain, scoring points, like helping your team, being a leader, but I never knew leader outside of athlete. And so it really, the lessons were just so vast because I was able to apply who I really am to other roles in life. I was, it shifted my focus to something beyond sports. That's beautiful. Do you still have a last key takeaway, like a personal insight that you would like to share? I'd love to share, like as, as the CEO of Hearts Unleashed, like It's my mission. It's what I believe in is that you can live your heart unleashed, meaning you can be who you are 
And, and you can be very successful as you are. You don't have to be someone else. You don't have to live up to someone else's definition of success or appropriate or, or, or worthy. You are you and you are perfect and you have all the permission in the world to be who you are. And where can people find you online or how can they best get in touch with you? Yes. I think that the fastest way is to head to abigailgazda.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Instagale and then my name, Abigail Gazda on Facebook. Um, I love Instagram. I had a lot of fun on there with my stories and stuff. So if you want to like hang out with me pretty personally, that's there. But I would love to invite people to shop abigailgazda.com. Alchemizing Judgment is coming out. And so it will be on sale. That's one of my three books. and so. Uh, enjoy reading all the, all the books are really great it's like listening to me talk <laughs> thanks so much for sharing all of your knowledge and your story with us and for everyone who's watching or listening we would love to hear from you um, please let us know what your favorite takeaway was from our conversation today in the comments below the video